Hello everyone, my name is John Kim and I'm so glad that you are joining us online today. If you're new, we'd love to give you a coffee on us. So go to the link grace.org slash hello online and we'd love to send you something. Can you believe it's already summer? Well, right now it's 60 degrees and cloudy as we're filming. So it doesn't really feel like summer yet, but emotionally I feel like summer has really snuck up on us this year. Maybe it feels the same for you as well. For those of you guys who are Grace Chapel members, we would love for you to vote on our elected positions and approve the new budget for the upcoming year. You could do that by going to grace.org 2022 annual meeting. We're also looking for some people to serve in Kidstown in all of our campuses this summer. So if you're able, please go to grace.org slash serve next gen to sign up to serve. Today, Pastor Brian will be kicking us off on our new summer series, Deep and Wise. We want to talk about wisdom this summer because it seems like wisdom is something we really need these days. Because when it comes to knowledge, we, you know, we have the world at our fingertips. We have on-demand access to more information than ever before. Yet we still find ourselves falling into the same problems over and over again as individuals and as a society. So maybe more knowledge isn't the answer. Maybe it's wisdom we need instead. The book of James in the New Testament is one of the shorter books in the Bible but it's saturated with timeless, practical wisdom. The readers of James knew the teachings of Jesus, but were looking for the right wisdom to help apply them in their complex, polarized, and fast-changing world. A world much like the one we live in today. So we would love for you to join us in worship today. Look 
goodness of God All my life, all my life, all my life You have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath, every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Well, it's the first Sunday of summer, so let's have a little fun as we get started. Let's go to the movies, Back to the Future. Uh, the 1980s trilogy follows a likable young man named Marty McFly and his scientist sidekick, Doc, as they travel through time in a souped up DeLorean, trying to save themselves and their town from ruin. In Back to the Future 2, Marty and Doc visit the year 2015 to set some things straight in Marty's future family. Well, no sooner have they arrived when Marty's boyhood nemesis, a bully named Biff, is seen lurking in the shadows. He's an old man now, of course, but he's still a thug. Snooping around, old man Biff finds a sports almanac that contains the scores of every sporting event between 1950 and 2000. He realizes that if someone had that information back in 1955, they could write a new future for themselves. So he hijacks the DeLorean and returns to 1955 to deliver the almanac to his younger self. Now, don't think too hard about all this, it's just a movie. Sure enough, with a few well-placed bets, grown-up Biff becomes a wealthy and powerful bully who turns the happy suburb of Hill Valley into a wasteland of crime and corruption, which means that Marty and Doc now have a new mission, Go back to 1955 and keep that almanac out of Biff's greedy grip. So, where am I going with all this? Well, simply this. Information in the hands of a fool can lead to disaster. If we want to write a better future for ourselves, what we really need is wisdom. Now, wisdom is the theme for our summer series, Deep and Wise. A few months ago, the teaching team sat down and asked ourselves, what do people need right now in the summer of 2022? What does the Bible have to offer us as we look beyond the pandemic to an uncertain and fast-changing future? Well, the answer we came up with was wisdom. Not just information, but wisdom. Information answers the question, what do I need to know? Wisdom answers questions like, what do I need to do? Who do I want to be? How do I want to live? And those are questions we're all asking as we look to the future uh, in a world that looks and feels markedly different than it did three years ago. What do we want to do? Who do we want to be? How do we want to live? I'd like you to think of a problem you're facing right now. Maybe it's a challenging situation at work, an ethical dilemma maybe, or a, a work-life balance kind of a question. Or maybe it's a relationship that's not going well with a friend or, or a family member. Maybe you're facing a big decision about your education or your career or your health or your finances. Take a minute right now. Think about a problem or a decision you're facing these days. 
What do you need to solve that problem or make that decision? More knowledge? Maybe. Sometimes information can help you sort things out. But ultimately what you need is wisdom. You need to know how to use that information in a way that leads to a good outcome for you and the, the people around you. So that's where we're headed this summer. We're going to travel back in time a couple of thousand years where we'll find a letter that can help us live better lives today and in the future. And like a sports almanac, this book doesn't contain a lot of information, but it's loaded with wisdom. It was written by a man named James to Christians who are facing some tough and uncertain times. So week by week this summer, we're going to make our way through this book in search of wisdom and a faith that really works. So let's get started with the opening lines of this book we call James, found in the New Testament. And today we're going to answer a few foundational questions to set up the rest of the series. What is wisdom? Where does it come from? How do we get it? And why does it matter? So let's get started. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. So from the get-go, we realize this isn't a letter from camp or a piece of business correspondence. It's a pastoral letter written by a spiritual leader to a flock under his care. Now, the first question is, who is this James we're talking about? Because there are, there are no less than six of them in the New Testament. There's, there's James, the, the son of Zebedee, brother of John, a member of Jesus' inner circle. It's probably not that James, because he was put to death by Herod Agrippa somewhere around 44 A.D. There's James the Less, another one of the original 12 disciples, but it's probably not him either, as he seems to have been in the background most of the time. Then there's James, the half-brother of Jesus, born later to Mary and Joseph. He doubted Jesus at first, along with the other half-brothers, but came to faith after the resurrection, when Jesus appeared to him personally. Now, we know from the book of Acts that this James became a prominent figure in the early church. So it seems most logical that, that he was the author of this letter, or that it was at least drawn from his teaching. Now, notice he describes himself as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's interesting on a couple of counts. For one thing, it's it's one of only two times Jesus is mentioned by name in this letter. Which is why some church leaders down through the centuries weren't, weren't even sure this book should have been included in the Bible. But notice what a strong affirmation James makes about Jesus here. That he is both Lord and Christ. Christ means that he was none other than the Messiah of Israel. And Lord means that he is himself God. And what makes this all the more interesting is remembering that James is saying this about his brother, the guy he grew up with, played with, argued with, and probably didn't always appreciate. How many times do you think uh, James heard teachers say, why can't you be more like your older brother? But even though Jesus isn't mentioned by name often in this letter, we're going to see that that his teaching inspired much of the wisdom that James has to offer. And who is James writing to? To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, does this mean that the letter was written only to Jewish believers in Jesus? Probably not. James seems to be using that expression to describe the new Israel, the church, followers of Jesus from every tribe and nation. So it's a multicultural community James is writing to, but a community that's been scattered by persecution all over the empire. The, the last thing to notice in this introduction is that James is not the sentimental type. <laughs> there are no warm words of affirmation and thanksgiving like we find in many of Paul's letters. 
just one word, greetings. We're going to find out that, that James is a pragmatist through and through. In other words, he's, he's probably not the pastor you want visiting you when you're in the hospital and you're looking for a little sympathy. I keep reading here and you'll see what I mean. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Well, like I said, not much of a bedside manner. So, you're in the hospital. Count it all joy, my friend, and don't mess it up. Now, we're actually going to come back to this passage next week and see what this joy in trials thing is, is all about. But for now, enough to point out that this, this persecution and scattering has made life both difficult and uncertain for these readers. Uh, they're living in unfamiliar territory, having to adapt to a new culture. As followers of Jesus, they, they don't fit in with Jews or with pagan Greeks and Romans. So, so they're isolated and suspect. They're probably dealing with some economic hardship and persecution as well. Uh, like many immigrants in our world today, they've likely left behind their homes and possessions and maybe even their livelihoods when they ran for their lives. So all this has put a great strain on them as human beings and as followers of Jesus. They're battling the temptation to just go along with the crowd to make life easier. Some of them are questioning their faith because of what's happened to them. <laughs> Some of them are questioning each other's faith. There's dissension and division among them over, over how they should be living. They're wrestling with their responsibility to the poor and the needy. And they're trying to make decisions in an unfamiliar and unpredictable environment. <laughs> Sound familiar? Uh, one commentator says that in the book of James, we get a picture of early Christians as they wrestled with the application of the life and teachings of Jesus in the concrete landscape of their own lives. So they had information. They knew how Jesus lived and what he taught. Their struggle was trying to put that knowledge into practice in their unfamiliar, uncertain world. I think it's safe to say that a couple of thousand year, years later, we're, we're struggling with the same kinds of things. Oh, we know what we believe for the most part. The challenge is living out that faith in a post-Christian, post-pandemic landscape. What those scattered believers needed, what we scattered believers need, is wisdom. And so that's where James takes them in the next couple of verses. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So let's try to get a handle on this thing called wisdom. What is it? Where does it come from? How do we get it? And why does it matter? So first, what is this wisdom James is talking about? Well, our dictionaries define wisdom as insight discernment, good sense, good judgment. So, so wisdom is more than knowledge. It's, it's using knowledge to live well. Uh, Karen was talking with one of our graduating seniors here in the Lexington lobby last Sunday. Uh, she asked him what field of study he was heading into, and he said, applied mathematics which begs the question every first-year algebra student asks as they labor over a quadratic equation. When am I ever going to use this in real life? Well, applied mathematics is all about using math in real life, applying mathematical concepts 
to solving real problems in, in medicine or, or industry or finance or technology. And now that I've used quadratic equations in a sermon, I can add applied mathematics to my resume. So wisdom is applied knowledge. It's using information to solve life's problems. Now, unfortunately, in today's world, we have a lot more knowledge than wisdom. Have you heard of information overload? If you haven't heard of it, I guarantee you've experienced it. Information overload is what happens when our brains are overwhelmed with data from the world around us. Data that may or may not be all that relevant to our lives. As one writer puts it, do we really need to know how many calories are in the giant vat of popcorn we just bought on our way into the movie theater? Can we do anything useful with next week's weather forecast for Paris if we're not in Paris? It's not just the amount of information that's a problem. It's the constant flow of it from our phones and computers, posts and podcasts, books and magazines, not to mention 500 channels and, and, and a dozen or so streaming services. According to neuroscientists, th this constant flow of facts can be so overwhelming, it actually impairs our ability to think and make decisions. And they've even come up with a name for it, infoxication. <laughs> Instead of having too much alcohol in our system, we have too much information. I actually Googled that phrase, too much information, and came across a pretty good song by Duran Duran. Hey TV child, look into my eyes. Here by intervention, I want your attention. So much information, the pressure's on the screen to sell you things that you don't need. It's too much information for me. And that was in the 90s, before we were all carrying smartphones around in our pockets. They say we're living in the information age. Unfortunately, we're not living all that well. Maybe what we need isn't more knowledge, but more wisdom. And biblically speaking, wisdom is skill for living. It's knowledge applied to the problems of everyday life. It's what we find in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. Getting good counsel is a skill for living. Those who work their land will have abundant food but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Working hard at whatever is in front of you is a skill for living. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Speaking carefully is a skill for living. If you put these skills into practice, your plans, your career, your relationships will likely go well. That's the biblical concept of wisdom. And James has often been called a New Testament version of Proverbs. He's not quite as pithy, but just as practical. So what is wisdom? Skill for living. Where does it come from? The God who made all things, James tells us. Look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, it makes sense when you stop and think about it. Who knows best how to get the most out of your new gizmo, whatever that gizmo happens to be? The person who designed it, right? That designer knows exactly what the gizmo is capable of, how it was put together, how to use it most effectively. If God made the world and everything in it, doesn't God know best how to live in this world? How to get the most out of this thing called life? 
And James goes on to tell us that, that God is eager to, to give us that wisdom and to give it generously and to give it to anyone who asks and to give it without wagging a finger and saying, why didn't you come to me sooner? Uh, turning to Proverbs again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. God made the world and put us in it for his glory and our joy. So why wouldn't God want us to live well in it? To get the most out of our work, our relationships, our bodies, our money, even our hardships. So God freely and gladly gives us wisdom. So what is wisdom? Skill for living. Where does it come from? The God who made all things. How do we get it? We seek it wholeheartedly. Let's look at the text again. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Now, when James says you must believe and not doubt, He's not saying you have to suppress your doubts and grit your teeth and try real hard to believe. It's, it's not name it and claim it, as some people have put it. For James, faith isn't something you have. It's something you do. So, so he's not talking about intellectual doubt. He's talking about behavioral doubt. He's talking about praying as if you're depending on God but living as if you're depending on yourself and on the wisdom of the world. Uh, taking your cues from, from Google or TikTok or Fox News or CNN or Trevor Noah or, or Oprah. Now, you can turn to those places for information, but for wisdom, you want to look to the God who made all things. And you want to do it continually and wholeheartedly. Remember how we said that, that even though Jesus isn't mentioned often in James, Jesus' teaching undergirds the whole book. Well, this is a great example. James seems to be echoing Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus is describing a God who gives generously to those who ask wholeheartedly, who keep on seeking and, and keep on knocking. Well, how do we do that? Well, we begin with prayer, obviously, asking God for wisdom. But then we don't just sit there waiting for wisdom to drop from the sky. We go looking for it. We search the scriptures. We get counsel from people who know us and know the Lord. We use the minds God gave us to, to reason and to do some research. And then we listen for the still, small voice of God's Spirit to show us the way. What is wisdom? Skill for living. Where does it come from? The God who made all things. How do we get it? We seek it wholeheartedly. And finally, why do we need it? To live well in an uncertain world. Let's look at James' words one more time. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Without God's wisdom to ground us and guide us, we end up being tossed about by whichever way the winds of culture or our own impulses might be blowing. We've chosen the, the Sea of Galilee as our graphic for this series, and we've chosen for a variety of reasons. Uh, for one thing, the Sea of Galilee is beautiful and life-giving. I've only been to Israel once, but far and away my favorite place was Galilee. 
The lake sits like a gemstone set in the rugged hills, a source of life and vitality for the entire region. No wonder Jesus spent so much time there. Uh, no wonder he and the disciples went there again and again to sort things out, to remember who they were, to commune with their heavenly Father. And God's wisdom is like that. A source of life and vitality in a wilderness of confusion, uncertainty, and foolishness. So we seek God's wisdom the way Jesus and his disciples sought the Sea of Galilee and found there what they needed to keep going. But there's another reason this image is so appropriate to our series. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is famous for how quickly storms can arise. Surrounded by these hills and valleys, the winds get tunneled out onto the sea in, in, in many directions at once, creating the kind of, of chop that, that James is describing in this passage. A wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. When those winds and waves blow, it, it can be confusing and difficult and overwhelming as we know from some of the gospel stories. And in the same way, we can find ourselves tossed about like a boat, blown this way and that by the winds of culture and the waves of information. But here's the thing about the Sea of Galilee. It's deep, nearly 150 feet deep in some places. And so when the surface of the water is a maelstrom of wind and waves, things are perfectly calm beneath the surface. If we can set the rudder of our lives deep into the wisdom of God, we can handle the wind and waves on the surface. We can navigate the challenges and problems of everyday life. Deep and wise. That's the kind of faith we're going to discover in the book of James, a faith that works. Because we find skill for living when we seek God and his wisdom. We find skill for living when we seek God and his wisdom. Well, let me finish with a, a personal testimony and an invitation. I'm remembering a time, a, a few months into the pandemic, when I was feeling overwhelmed by the challenges of leading and pastoring in such a confusing, fast-changing, and, and polarized season. I've been a pastor for a long time. I've got lots of experience. I've got lots of education. I've read lots of books. But nothing had quite prepared me for all that we were dealing with during COVID, including the, the social and cultural unrest that was happening at the time. And the questions just kept coming. What should we do? How should we do it? Who should we be listening to? Ask anyone who was leading anything during COVID, and they'll tell you how perplexing, how exhausting, and at times how lonely it was. Well, as I was driving to church one day, feeling all of this, a worship song came to mind, and I found myself singing it alone in the car. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. And that song became my rudder for the weeks and months to come. It reminded me that beneath the surface of the storm we were living through, there was wisdom to be found. And that if I and we kept looking to God, to his word, to his people, to his spirit, he would show us the way. He would keep us steady. He would guide us through. And here we are. By God's grace and wisdom, we, we not only made it through, 
We've seen God do good and beautiful things in and through our church. The celebration video we watched just a few minutes ago, the, the annual report we've published online. They, they tell a story of changed lives, new faces, fruitful ministry, and a church that's poised to write a new future. I can testify that we find skill for living when we seek God and his wisdom. So let me invite you to think again of that problem I asked you to think of at the beginning of the message. A challenge at work, a relationship that's not going well, a big decision. <laughs> Chances are two or three of those kinds of things came to mind. Let me invite you to seek God's wisdom this summer. Bring it to God every day in prayer. Spend time in the scriptures with us on Sundays and, and, and on your own through the week. Talk with friends and family who know you and know the Lord, your small group maybe. Give yourself some time and space to think. And then listen for the still, small voice of God saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this world you've made and for putting us in it. Thank you for promising to give us wisdom when we seek it wholeheartedly from you. We pray that you might meet us this summer, each of us and all of us. Speak into our lives, our homes, our work, and our church. Show us the way to the future you've prepared for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for joining us today. As you were listening to Pastor Brian, I hope that you found ways to be able to seek wisdom with all of your heart. I encourage that you do that with us this summer. We also ask that you would read the book of James alongside with us during your personal time during the summer as we seek wisdom together. Thank you all so much for joining us today.